Okay, so the music's turned down, so I think that's time to go. Somebody in the back want to give me a thumbs up? All right, we got a thumbs up. We're ready to go. Hi, so I'm Ryan Nowak. I'm a developer and architect working on ASP.NET Core. Uh, I have a long time, at, I guess at this point, ASP.NET team member. I've been a part of the team since before .NET Core was a thing, back when it was ASP.NET 5 and then when it was Project K. Uh, hopefully some of y'all have been with us um, through all of that growing pains and all of those times. Uh, if you want, you can find me on Twitter. And sometime later today, you'll be able to find all of my presentation materials at that address. So today, uh, we're going to be talking about some new ideas as part of ASP.NET Core. And we're going to be talking about some things that are a little bit further in the future. These are some big ideas that are going to shape the next five years of ASP.NET Core development. Now, something that probably sticks out is that all of these are going to be tied to something that exists. You'll probably realize that when I'm talking about this. And we realize at this point that ASP.NET Core is pretty broad. We're at 3.0 after all. But there's still plenty of refinement to do. And I want to share some of these ideas to get your feedback and get you thinking about things and try to convince you that there's still some innovation left in the tank for some of the things that you're already familiar with. So you probably didn't realize today when you came in here that you're going to make a deal with me. Uh, but look, the deal is I'm going to share some information about some of our bold ideas and some of our future thinking things. And in exchange, I just want you to remember that none of these things are committed roadmap. Nothing that you're going to hear today is an announcement. These are all just ideas and things that we're going to develop further and hopefully get your feedback on. Some of these things that we're going to talk about might be the right solution to the wrong problem, or they might be the wrong solution to the right problem, or they just might be things that we decide not to do for whatever reason. So keep that in mind as you're hearing about this stuff. Um, as with any of these talks that are coming from Microsoft, uh, tell us what you like. Tell us what you would use it for. Your feedback is incredibly valuable in helping us understand what to build and what to do. So first up, we're going to talk about something called Project Bedrock. And in order to understand what that is, we're going to need a little bit of background about the HTTP server. So I want to introduce you to Kestrel. Kestrel is our HTTP server, and it was written, it was written by engineers on our team as part of .NET Core 1.0 because, well, we needed a cross-platform HTTP server. If you're going to build a web platform that works everywhere, you need a server that works everywhere. So we had a long legacy with IIS on Windows, but we wanted to build a server that we could take everywhere and give everybody the same experience, no matter what operating system you're developing on or what operating system you're deploying to. Now, what you're seeing on this screen is the results from the Tech Empower Web Framework benchmarks. Um, this, in particular, is the plain text benchmark, which is part of the Tech Empower suite. There are some more. And this particular one is like a 50-meter sprint. So you should think about this like, what's the minimum amount of framework overhead? Like, what's the fastest your server can do? It's a measurement of how much overhead the server adds and what are the sort of raw capabilities of the server. There are some other benchmarks that are part of Tech Empower that are a little bit more realistic, but this one is really just hello world and it's kind of a race, right? Um, so you can see us hanging out here at about 10 or 11. Uh, 10 and 11 are both us, the red lines. But really, this is a 17-way tie. So on, with these Tech Empower benchmarks for plain text, there's currently a 17-way tie at the maximum theoretical throughput for this particular benchmark. We're maxing out the network. Uh, if you look at what some of these other frameworks are, over here in this language column, I guess it's abbreviated LNG, you'll see Rust, C++, Go, and the only other sort of managed stack that you'll see there is Java. Uh, the rest of these are all going to be native code kinds of stacks. So clearly we're doing something right if in this competitive benchmark we're getting into the top sort of echelon and we're with everybody else in a tie to max out uh, what's possible at the benchmark. So that's, that's something we've done so far. Um, this is kind of a layering diagram of what Kestrel looks like in ASP.NET Core 2.0. Uh, and you might not have much experience thinking about these bottom two layers because they're not the kinds of things you typically write applications with. You're not normally thinking about what's going on inside the details of the web server when you write an application. But that's okay because that's what I'm here to explain to you. So before an HTTP request gets to the middleware pipeline, the server has already done a bunch of complicated things. Uh, the server manages TCP connections, it deals with timeouts, it deals with a bunch of security features, and it translates raw bytes going over the internet into the kinds of objects that you get to interact with in your ASP.NET Core application. So if we gave you instead a server where you just get like a stream and raw bytes and you have to parse the headers yourself and you have to write the body yourself and you have to write the headers yourself, that wouldn't be very good. You wouldn't want to use it. Uh, it wouldn't be very productive for, for you. Uh, at the bottom of this diagram, on the left side, and that's from V1, is libuv. 
LibUV, if you're not familiar with it, is the C library that's at the core of Node.js. Um, people probably use Node, at least hopefully everybody's heard of Node. So we actually in V1 took the, the library that's at the heart of Node and made it the cornerstone of our server. Uh, the reason why we would do that is, well, they wrote a pretty good implementation and it's cross-platform. So we had an existing cross-platform library that we could use for sockets and TCP and all kinds of networking related things that we could build a server on top of. And LibUV's purpose in all of this is that it does those things that I just mentioned. It handles TCP connections and it deals with translating raw bytes and sending those in and out from the wire. Uh, then a funny thing happened. As we worked on Kestrel and we went on this sort of performance journey of ASP.NET Core, we outgrew LibUV's performance. So we got to the point where LibUV was the bottleneck of our stack and we had an opportunity to take a big bet on .NET and make .NET better. So along with that, we replaced LibUV with .NET Sockets and we did a bunch of work on .NET Sockets to make their performance great. And that gets, to, that gets us to where we are right now. So if you think about Kestrel and serving your application, what's actually going on at the network layer is it's using that familiar class system that socket socket like we're using types in the BCL to do all of our network I/O in Kestrel, um, and that's because of investments that we made in performance at that layer. Uh, so we think of this bottom layer here. We call this the transport layer, uh, since that's the thing that's transporting bytes somewhere else when you make a network connection. Now, when we started work on HTTP/2, HTTP/2 is a change at the top layer of the server. Um, so if you think about what happens when you have a different network protocol, there's a different structure, different parsing, different interactions with streams, those kind of things. And so we extracted that top layer and turned it into something we call the protocol layer. And we have three protocols that we support that are in the box. We have HTTP, HTTP2, and SignalR. Uh, and we had to extract a genuine layer there because uh, we needed to replace HTTP with something else. So now we've got this sort of delicious layer cake here. On the bottom layer, we have the transport layer. We have connections in raw I.O. On the top layer, we have protocols, the things that provide structure and provide meaning to those raw bytes and provide useful semantics that you use to build applications. And in the middle, we have that delicious layer of peanut butter that we call the server. And you can sort of think of that like the traffic cop that's mediating between those two things and managing the contracts between those two layers. So transports and protocols. What do we get when transports and protocols are replaceable? Well, we have a bunch of options. So you could have a transport that is named pipes. You could do HTTP over named pipes. You could do HTTP over a Unix domain socket. You could do HTTP3. You could do SignalR. Uh, you could do AMQP and, and MQTT, which are some new protocols that are emerging that are really exciting. So we kind of developed this recipe for how we want to architect the server and developed a recipe for how we make those components replaceable so that we're better equipped to deal with change in the future and to adopt new stuff in the future. So that's basically product project Bedrock defined. Uh, Bedrock is an API that we created for client server networking. We're not gonna go over it in detail here because it's a little bit kind of expert and, and maybe not something that you're gonna use inside your actual application. Uh, but Bedrock is the API and the design sort of exercise that led to the creation of all those types in system IO pipelines. So if you've heard us talk about high performance networking in C Sharp, if you've read about span and read only, uh, read only structs and all those kinds of things, a lot of that work across .NET aligned with this bedrock effort and a lot of those types like uh, pipelines and spans were sort of shaped by this effort to say, let's get our network stack in, in order Let's get the server part of this into a design where we're ready to replace these components with different components as we need to adapt to change. Uh, so these APIs are in .NET Core. If you own something that does its own network communication, they're there for you to start using and start building with. Um, and the other sort of thing about this is, well, we think that .NET is actually a really good language for doing this sort of low-level network communication with all the changes that have gone into C Sharp lately and C Sharp 7.2 and 7.3 and with pipes and spans and all these other great low level primitives, we feel like we're actually in a really good place for you to write low level code that does network IO and it's safe. Like you're not gonna have memory problems, you're not gonna have crashes and it doesn't have to be quite as complicated as doing this in like C or C++. If you remember back to that diagram that we looked at earlier, there's a whole lot of servers at the top that are written in native code, and some of them are in safe native languages like Rust and Go, and some of them are in, well, less safe native languages like C and C++. Uh, Java's up there too in a few cases. We think that .NET is uh, getting better for this kind of thing every day, 
and is a really good choice for building this kind of detailed low-level code that you can do safely if you're, if you're careful. So now I want to show you a quick demo. Um, and who's, uh, hopefully people here have heard of SignalR. If you haven't heard of SignalR, there's one hand up there. All right, we got one guy. Um, so if you haven't used SignalR before, SignalR is a real-time two-way communication protocol. Uh, primarily, it's used in browsers with WebSockets. Uh, what does that all mean? Well, primarily, that means that you can use it to build a chat application. So I'm going to show you I'm going to show you my great chat application because that's what everybody does the first time with SignalR, and then we'll get a little bit weird with it. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and fire this up, and I've got my chat window here. And for any good chat demo, I'm going to need two windows. So I'll split that off, okay, and I'll say hello from the left side. And when I do that, it's going to appear on both screens because I'm using SignalR here. So both of these, both of these windows are using the JavaScript, uh, JavaScript or TypeScript SignalR client, connecting to my ASP.NET Core server running SignalR, and they're sending and receiving messages from the same hub. They're part of the same chat room. I, I can come over here and I can say hello from the right side. And these are just broadcasts. Everybody who's listening to this hub is getting all the same kinds of messages. If you wanted to see how this works, I could bring up the developer tools over here. And I can go to WebSocket. I have to refresh for Chrome to pick this up. And you can see that there's a WebSocket here. That's what this, that's what this little thing indicates. If I send another message here, then you can see I'm getting a WebSocket response from the server. That's this, down, this red down arrow means sending down to me. And that's how I'm getting this message. It's coming over that real-time connection. So let's get a little bit weird with it. I have got this other client here. And this is a, this is a console client. And what I'm using in here is I'm using the vanilla .NET C Sharp uh, SignalR client. But what I have done is I've replaced the transport layer. And it's not doing WebSockets. It's actually doing TCP directly. So there's no HTTP here. Um, there's no doing an HTTP request and then doing a negotiation and then opening a WebSocket. It's at a much, much lower level than that. So I can send, you know, hello from TCP. And it's going to show up in both of these windows over here, just like it were coming from a WebSocket. Is that cool? It's a little bit cool. OK, great. Um, so so that's, that's kind of interesting. Why, why might you care about that? Why might you want more options than just using WebSockets? What kind of things do you get out of replacing the network protocol? Well, different transport layer protocols might be more efficient. They might be more direct. They might use less resources. Or they might give you different security options, like using a, a Unix domain socket or using a named pipe gives you a different set of security options than using a WebSocket. Maybe you're building an application that has to do communication, and you don't want to think about how do I secure HTTP as part of this application. You could do some kind of Windows thing with named pipes. So there's a bunch of different options that you have here. And the, the bedrock effort is really just about giving you options for the network protocol and about setting us up with more ability to customize and build and grow this area in the future. Uh, so the, th the changes that are different here, the things that make this work from your normal sort of SignalR application, I have a listener here, so I'm listening on the loopback at port 5000. And I'm not passing anything in here, so this is just going to do the normal Kestrel thing. It's going to normally run my HTTP pipeline. So when my browser WebSocket client connects, it's going to go down this pipeline. It's going to do the normal browser WebSocket thing. But then I've got this other listener here, and I'm listening on loopback 5006. And instead of going down the normal HTTP pipeline, I've got this builder here, and I can show you it's a listen options builder. It's not an application builder. It's not, a, it's not an ASP.NET Core middleware pipeline. It's something much more primitive and low level than that. And SignalR already has the support in the box to wire itself up to that. So I can wire up this same chat hub that I'm using over HTTP and WebSockets directly to that TCP connection. Over here in my client side application, the only thing that's different in this console application is instead of giving myself a WebSocket URL, I'm giving myself a TCP connection and saying, hey, go to this TCP address. So the future of Project Bedrock, what, is that, what does that future hold? We think that these APIs are pretty good, and so they're public and stable in 3.0. Uh, what's left here is that we need more protocols and transports. Uh, so on the horizon is Quick. Quick is part of HTTP 3. It's a new transport layer protocol that is used instead of TCP 
with, uh, with HTTP3. The team is already working on and thinking about HTTP3. We were a little bit behind where we wanted to be with HTTP2, but we got there. Um, we're sort of committed to being a little bit more ahead of the game with HTTP3, and that sort of things are already happening. Uh, the other aspect of this is you. Um, there's a long tail of libraries that do networking, do database connections, talk to Redis, talk to message queues. Um, we think the community has the potential to benefit from this work immensely. Uh, we have created a sort of battle-hardened recipe around doing this kind of efficient networking communication, and we think that the libraries that are out there in the .NET community can leverage this and continue to get better and better. Uh, so thanks to David Fowler who helped me prepare this section. If you want to see these examples or see these APIs or some of uh, Fowler's demos, you can follow these links later and check those things out. Uh, next, I want to talk about Project Houdini, which relates to all of our frameworks we ship and how they integrate or don't integrate with the rest of our framework. So let me ask, uh, does this seem balanced? Uh, I have got a list here of features that exist in ASP.NET Core. And I'm sort of dividing them up between whether they're implemented at the platform layer or whether they're part of ASP.NET Core MVC. Uh, so we have the ASP.NET Core platform on the left with like a couple things that are unique to it. And we have MVC on the right with this like embarrassment of riches, right? Like there's all these features over in this right column that are unique to MVC. Let's add some more frameworks to this mess. So let's add SignalR and let's add gRPC. Uh, anything that's part of the platform layer you get a uniform experience across all these frameworks. It's shared, it's reusable, it's sort of set up for you to get the same thing uh, no matter what of these experiences you're using. Anything in MVC, if you wanna share it across any of these frameworks, you don't really have the option to do that because it's locked to MVC. Um, so our options, if we want to say, reuse routing inside of SignalR, well, we ended up duplicating that, and that's actually what, that's actually what uh, SignalR prior to 3.0 was like, is it had its own routing system that was separate from the routing system in MVC. So lately, I've been peeling the onion here to see how many platform level features should be abstracted from MVC. How many things that are here should probably be pushed down lower in the stack and should be made more general purpose and more reusable. Routing was the obvious place to start here because so many other decisions are driven by what routing does. So in 3.0, we made a change to the routing system and we made a new routing system be the default. The old one is still there, you can still use it, um, but we're strongly encouraging everybody to get to this new one. Uh, and the reason is because, well, it's, it's universal. It solves a bunch of problems with the old one. We think it's better in every way. And we're working, we're working to address scenarios that keep people from adopting the new thing and get them on it. Uh, new stuff like Blazor Server and gRPC don't integrate with the old system, they only integrate with the new one. So gradually over time, we're gonna move more and more scenarios onto the new system and eventually try to rip the old one out. And as you can see in this code sample, there's a whole galaxy of stuff that's plugging in here to the same routing system. Uh, we got controllers, we got pages, we got SignalR, we got gRPC, we got Blazor. You can do routerware, you can do all kinds of powerful things with this new routing system. Uh, the other thing that's cool about this is they're using the same auth system. So not only, and that's, that's part of the payoff of this, is the routing system solves a bunch of problems between integration between frameworks like MVC and middleware like authorization. Uh, so all of these frameworks that can use this routing system all use the same auth system. It's all integrated and it all works the same. Uh, now, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna do a super deep dive on the design of the routing system. I did do a talk about that at NVC London that's called Lessons Learned Building MVC. About half of that talk is dedicated to this area. So if you're interested in that, uh, you should be able to find that on YouTube and check it out and get a better understanding of this. So this is a layering diagram of what things look like now that we have endpoint routing in the picture. Uh, you can see on top, we've got, or on the bottom, you've got server, which we talked about already. You've got middleware. You've got routing, which is a particular middleware. And then on top, you've got all these lovely frameworks that are built on top of routing. So I'm really happy with this because if I can make a diagram that's this simple and it describes the truth, then that's a really good position to be in because it means that, that things are sort of in the right shape and everything is right with the world. Um, so now we're set up to unpack Project Houdini. What Endpoint Routing did is we took some MVC features and we made them disappear. Uh, they didn't disappear exactly. They got turned into more useful things um, and got put into some other situations. They, I, I like to think they sort of got broken off and got shared lower in the framework. Um, in practice, this is a little less graceful than it sounds because we haven't been able to invent magic yet. Um, but gradually over time, we're gonna be migrating people to the new system. We're gonna make sure that people are happy with it and that it does what they want. And eventually the old one will go away. 
Uh, that's a long process and we expect that it's gonna take multiple releases for any of this kind of work. Um, because we, genu we genuinely want to make it worth your while if we're asking you to change something. Uh, we think there's a lot of value in this for everyone. Um, and it often gives us an opportunity if we're refactoring something or relayering something to address a bunch of scenarios that we found out about since the last time we worked on this code. Um, and before anybody gets upset about this, we're not trying to make MVC disappear. Your controllers and your pages and all those things are gonna be around forever. Um, and they're gonna be primary to the programming model of ASP.NET Core forever. We still think that controllers are one of the best ideas for doing web in .NET. And we don't plan to like take them away. Uh, what we're talking about here is just about giving people more options. So I wanna architect your brain for a minute. Uh, and I wanna talk about what controllers do and what some other things kinda do. Uh, controllers are a very like declarative solution, right? They give you a place to put methods on a class. They give you a place to write parameters. They give you a place to declare a return type. They give you a place to put attributes. And they give you a lot of power as long as the power that you want fits with that model. So if you hear me right, like what you can express with your parameters and your return types and your attributes, if it's a good fit for how the framework behaves is what you want, then it feels really good to use. If what you want is not a good fit for what the framework provides with those attributes and parameters and return types, then it doesn't feel very good to use. On the other hand, um, imperative solutions, you write the code you want and it does the things that you want. Um, they're often a little bit more verbose, um, but in exchange for that, everything is very pay for play. Like, you, you told us exactly what to do and we're just doing it. Um, they're usually a little bit simpler to understand because there's no magic and there's no secrets going on. And if you're very performance sensitive in some scenario, imperative solutions are often a better choice because you're in control. You control everything that happens there. Um, so it becomes apparent if, you th if, if what I said about fit and declarative solutions kind of got you, like right here, we're missing imperative solutions for a bunch of the things that MVC provides. So like model binding, formatters, validation, a bunch of those things. We don't really have options, like we don't really have code for you to call to do those things. Or if you tried to do it, you realized you have to write like 20 lines of code, and you gave up and you said, this is too complicated, I can't maintain this, I don't understand this. Um, that's, that's our fault, that's on us. Um, I think, I, think we're missing, I think we're missing some stuff here. I think we're missing some solutions that uh, make those kinds of things possible. So we sort of asked myself like, well, a good way to solve that problem is to think about what would it take for you to be happy and successful writing ASP.NET Core apps with no framework at all? Like, what if there was no MVC? What if you, what if you just wrote the code, right? Um, this kind of style is really popular with Go and with Node.js and with a bunch of other styles of frameworks and tech stacks. There's some frameworks in .NET that do this and some pieces of infrastructure that do. It hasn't really caught on in .NET at the same rate as it has in other places. But I wanted to give it a try and I wanted to think about what this would look like. So I made a graph. Um, this isn't scientific. I get to make up the criteria and the results. Uh, so very, uh, very arbitrary. But hopefully it helps demonstrate my point to you if you're a little bit of a visual person. Um, so this is a graph of how declarative an approach is versus how rich it feels. And I, wanna, I want you to think about richness as how easily can you find a solution to your problem that feels right? Um, so if we're talking about MVC and you're thinking about, okay, I wanna read some JSON from the body, there's from body attribute, right? That feels right. You're telling us what you want and we're doing it. Or if you're using API controller, you don't even have to say from body, we just do it. We assume that's what you want, and it feels right. Um, richness is ultimately what you want in a framework. It's what makes you happy when you use something like MVC or Razor Pages. Being declarative is probably the most common way to get there in .NET. Um, however, if you're optimizing for performance, you might not want to be declarative because every feature has a cost, and you might not always want the cost of all those features. Um, so for controllers, we're sort of over here in this like 80% bucket, right? Very, very declarative, because you express everything by methods and attributes. Uh, and there's only a few concerns that you're expected to handle yourself inside your action method. The framework does the rest. Um, the key is that it feels really good if you have the right tools to solve your problems, which is why I'm only giving us like an 80% in richness. There's some tools here that are missing. If you contrast that with routing, well, you get to write delegates. It's like writing a middleware. Like it's very bare bones. You don't really have a lot of tools available to you. 
Um, and so it's not very rich either. If you want solutions to the kinds of problems you have or the kind of tasks you have to perform, you have to write those pieces of code yourself. So I've been doing a lot of thinking about what it would look like to make solutions to those problems. I don't want to add more declarative stuff because that would just sort of turn routing into MVC, and we already have MVC. Controllers already do that. Um, so what if we added more imperative constructs? What if we added more services I could interact with and more ways of solving the same problems um, that would work with something like routing on its own? And I reckon it would still be useful for the times where you're using controllers as well. So that brings me to Project Houdini and something I like to call route to code. And I'm really asking two questions here. Um, how, can I, how can we make minimal back-end services feel good? I, I want to ho hover in on that word minimal. And when I say minimal, I mean like, do you have a service that's going to have like four endpoints in it? Do you have a, do you have a, do you have a service where you're going to write like 50 lines of code? Do you feel like ASP.NET Core can do that? Um, we look at some other tech stacks out there and we say, well, Go can do that. I bet we could make .NET do that. Um, in addition, I want to think about if you're writing one of these small applications that's going to be really simple, um, can we remove some concepts? Can we simplify the number of things you think about? Can we make it scale really well to having a really small amount of code? I think we already do a pretty good job when you have a large amount of code. Um, I think we've found this niche with um, people having 50 controllers or 100 controllers or 50 projects or 100 projects in their solution. Um, does it feel really good to use a small amount of code with ASP.NET Core? And that's really what I'm after here. So I have a demo of this, and I've taken some risks, and I've made some, I've made some assumptions, and I've shaken things up a little bit, and I'm going to point out some of those things to, to you. So what if you created a new ASP.NET Core application, and like this was what you get by default? Um, and just to prove that I'm not bluffing, I'll open up. You can ignore the man behind the curtain, ignore these other projects here. I've got my weather application and I've got a config file and beyond that I've literally got just one file here. There's one code file. Um, I am cheating a little bit. I will acknowledge that I'm cheating. I put my, my data model in another project but let's assume that you, you've got some data model and we're really talking about could the ASP.NET Core part of your app be one class, one file, that simple. So what I've done here is I've kind of combined like program CS and startup. This is, this is all of those things in once. And I've introduced a base class, and I've given it a presumptive namespace to assume like it's part of the framework already. Like, I'm already shipping this, great. Um, and look at how much complexity goes away. Like, I don't, I don't need a configure services because I haven't added any services. Um, I don't need that big program main method because I'm not customizing what goes on there anyway. I mean, who is? Um, and I just have this configure method with the middleware pipeline that I care about. Um, so it's really kind of slimmed down and bare bones and simple. Let's try and add some code to this. So I'm going to build a really simple weather processing application, and we're just going to do some weather forecasting. And I've already written this class, which is my weather supercomputer. So I'll get an instance of my computer, and I'm just going to close over this, my weather supercomputer. I'm just going to close over this and use this here, and it's going to be treated kind of like it's a singleton. If I wanted to make this come from DI, I could register it as a service, and I could just say, uh, I could just say services dot get required service and get it that way, but we're not going to mess with that right now. So now I'd like to add some routes, or I'd like to add some things that are going to handle requests here. And I can do that with this endpoints builder. So I would just say endpoints dot map get. I'm going to have two sort of actions here. I'm going to handle weather for place. And then inside here, I'm going to get the HTTP context. And I'm going to read this place route value because that's how I'm going to look up what the weather forecast is. Var place equal to, I have to cast it to a string. This route values is untyped. Context, request, route values. And I want to get the place. And then I'm going to take this place and I'm going to ask my weather supercomputer, can it tell me about the weather? Computer.getForecast. And I'll give it the place. And then what do I want to do? Well, I want to write this out as JSON. Um, one, of the, one of the things that you run into a lot with .NET is that the efficient ways of doing things are often not the simplest ways of doing things. So if I wanted to be really simple, I could serialize this to a string, and then I could write the string. If I wanted to be really efficient, I could add a using, I could create a serializer, I could call some complicated method, blah. So we can, we can help. We're here to help. 
Um, one of the things that's in, one of the ideas that's in my prototype here is, well, what if I had methods on the response for that? And you see that and you're like, how did we get this far? How did we get to V3 without having this? It's kind of it's kind of mystifying, right? Um, let's do the same thing. Let's handle some input. And I'm just going to I'm going to copy paste this and I'll customize it. So we're going to handle a post. We're going to use the same route. We're going to get the place the same. And instead of getting the weather from our computer, this is an update of a weather forecast that's coming from one of my many reporters in the field. Um, I'm going to read that from the body. Read JSON async. I have to pass in the type I want, and it'll deserialize. And then instead of, instead of writing it back out to the response, I'm just going to update my computer. Update forecast, place, weather. So like, do you have apps that are this simple? Do you have scenarios where you need to write like two things or three things? Um, can we make it better? Can we make it feel nice to use and, and everything? Now, there, there are some things to talk about here. There are some things that you're giving up. So you're giving up unit testability, right? Because these are, these are methods that are lambdas that are in routing, right? You could write integration tests for this, but you can't really write unit tests for it. One of the things that makes controllers the way they are, it's on purpose, right? The fact that controllers are classes with methods that you can call, it's on purpose. It's for unit testing. Um, what we're missing here, and this is, I think, sort of an artifact of the prototype, is, well, we're missing rich model binding and validation. I'm, I'm sort of cheating a little bit by saying, yeah, I'm going to read the JSON. I'm going to write the JSON. I'm assuming that they sent me JSON. Um, if they didn't send me JSON, it's going to crash pretty hard. Uh, so a real version of this would include those options. But it would also probably include low, uh, these sort of low-level primitives like reading and writing JSON directly for the case where you're not willing to pay the cost for that. So there's a future where we're giving you more options here. And I think it looks like something like this plus let's take model binding out of MVC and make it separate. Let's take formatters out of MVC and make them separate and give you some options to build these kind of applications. Cool. So that's that demo. So the future of this looks like us, I think, looks like us continuing the work we started with routing. We want to gradually and gently evolve MVC in a way that you're happy to come with us and you think that it's helping you. Um, and we want to move features down in the platform. This helps make MVC and ASP.NET Core and SignalR and gRPC and all these other things feel more consistent and capable no matter what feature set you're using. In parallel with this, we want to continue to try and build up this sort of small code, small concept, small complexity scenario. And we want to add more options that give you direct control when you feel like you need it. Let's shift gears pretty dramatically now. And I want to talk to you about publishing. I know, it's a really exciting topic. Um, who, who here, show of hands, who here has got an application that they do a self-contained publish with? That is not that many people. Wow. OK, I'm going to assume that the rest of you just were too shy to put your hand up. Um, so I have got some screenshots on this slide comparing a normal self-contained publish with a single file self-contained publish. A uh, single file self-contained publish is a thing that we added in, is in .NET Core 3.0, and it gives you the ability to sort of bundle all the executable parts of your publish output into a single file. So if you remember, we started talking about .NET Core 1.0. It was a really, really exciting idea that we could have a version of .NET Core that you could just you know, drag and drop somewhere. Um, now we're talking about having a version of your application that includes .NET Core that is just a single file that you can drag and drop somewhere, right? Um, so looking at this data in a little bit more detail, uh, single file today, you get five files. Most of them are config, and you get one runnable file. And for a normal publish, you get a whopping 324 files. Um, they're both around the same size. They're both coming in just under 95 megabytes. Uh, and the reason why it's 95 megabytes is it includes all of .NET. It includes all of the dependencies that you need to run .NET, including native code, including XML, including crypto, Everything that's not part of the operating system for whatever platform you're running on is, is part of that publish output. These results, by the way, are for release on Linux, um, but it's not significantly different on other operating systems. So we asked ourselves, like, well, 95 megs is kind of a lot. Can we make this better? Can we lean into this? Can we do a little bit more? Um, so we've done some investigations into this. 
Um, and we, we really looked at a bunch of different axes that sort of push the boundaries of the .NET tech. So even if you're not a self-contained published person, I hope you're gonna hear about some stuff in this section that's gonna energize you and excite you because there's some other things that are happening here that are, that are gonna be useful to you no matter what kind of .NET you're doing. Um, so our criteria for sort of looking into this is we don't wanna make any compromises on performance. Um, we feel like our performance for ASP.NET Core is really strong already uh, for runtime throughput. We don't wanna give up any of that. Um, we do wanna make startup performance better. We feel like that's not good enough. And so a big part of this investigation was, well, what if we tried to improve startup performance? What if we threw everything at it? What could we do? Um, in addition to that, we're willing to pay some additional costs for publish time. If it takes another 10 or 15 seconds when you publish, that's not typically an operation that you're waiting for. We think that 10 or 15 seconds of additional time, if it's a publish versus a build is acceptable. That's a trade-off you'd be willing to get to, uh, to live with if you're getting a lot out of it. Um, and lastly, any sort of tools or workflow changes or fundamental pivots we make to .NET have to be something that everybody can leverage. So all of these changes have to be things that are within striking distance of every person and every app. If you have to jump through like a million flaming hoops to get to the point of being able to uh, do, uh, do a self-contained publish or do a small publish or leverage any of these new features, not a solution. If we can't take you with us, it's not worth doing. Uh, you might be asking at this point, why, do, why don't we just use Mono? Um, we know that Mono can make some really small apps. I will also work on Blazor. Blazor is a Mono app right now, and it's, it's about you know, uh, under five megs or so. Um, we know that Mono is optimized for that and kind of has that, that going on already. And the answer is, because this is about server, we wanted it to be based on Core CLR, and we didn't want to lose any of the nice performance we have or things that we have with Core CLR. Uh, we are using a lot of the ideas from Mono and we're using a lot of the tool chain from Mono. So we're not ignoring that that exists and we're not throwing it away, um, but we're using Core CLR as our starting point. This led to a bunch of ideas all over .NET to try and make this better. And I'm gonna talk through over the next couple minutes what some of these things are and then I'll show you some data. So the runtime team was able to write a more advanced version of the single file host. I know I've shared with you already in 3.0, you can do a publish and you can get a single file host out of it that's got all the runtime, all the native stuff in one, one package. They've made a really advanced version of that as part of this prototype that has all your assemblies and all your native components in it, but it's designed in such a way that when it loads those assemblies, it just puts them in a memory, maps them into a location that the loader can understand and is able to load those assemblies with zero copies. So there's no like unzipping files to disk or copying things around in memory. It's really, really advanced and it's probably about as optimized as something like this could get if we still wanted to retain assembly identity. Um, we have done experiments in the past where we say, let's just put all your assemblies in one big blob. It doesn't go well. Um, it breaks library code. It breaks assumptions that library authors have. Uh, it creates some big problems. So this is about as efficient as it can get for doing something like this. Um, the change is relatively neutral on size and it decreases the startup time significantly because there's no extra copying happening. So this gives us a single file. What kinds of things can we do to make it faster? You can open the context menu. So to make things faster, and I'm talking about startup performance, so how do we get into your app? We have a couple tools. One that we already have is called CrossGen. Uh, if you haven't heard of CrossGen before, that's okay. You're already benefiting from it because it's already on for you in most scenarios where you're running your code. Uh, CrossGen is something we use on pretty much everything we ship that ships in the box with .NET Core. And what it does is it does a lot of the work that the JIT can do up front. There are some limitations on things that CrossGen can't do, um, and there are some things that CrossGen does slightly less well that we avoid. Uh, but generally, you should think of CrossGen does the JIT and the loader's work up front as much as possible to try and make the initial run of your managed code faster. Uh, and what it does is it trades speed for size. So you're getting a whole lot of startup speed, you're giving up a lot of size because things are getting bigger because in addition to the IL version of your code, you've got native versions of your code in the same DLL. However, uh, since we wanted to preserve startup, we didn't want to, uh, I guess, go backwards or regress in our startup performance, CrossGen was a must because we have that on today, um, which hurts the size goal a little bit. If you had a scenario where you really cared about the size and you didn't care at all about the startup performance, turning this off is an option you have. You can strip this out and you'll get a little bit smaller by a couple megabytes. Um, so single file host here does a, big, does a big part of the heavy lifting to try and make the performance better in this scenario. Um, and it's, a, it's basically an improvement over every other option that we have for this in this case today. 
Uh, at the managed layer, we're peeling the onion here. Uh, we basically use the hello world kind of ASP.NET REST API application, and we're trying to figure out what contributes to startup. And the way that we approach that is like, well, let's profile, and then let's slice off the features that show up as being the most expensive, and then let's profile and measure, and let's continue that exercise until we get to a set of recommendations about things that don't feel good or things that could be removed. Um, the outcome of doing all this investigation is, is actually genuinely surprised me. There's not a lot going on in the managed code that's slow from our point of view. Um, what is slow is just the volume of code that has to run at startup when you consider something like MVC. There's just a lot of stuff happening. And the best path forward for us, we feel like rather than optimizing individual bits of code, um, which has its place as well, is, well, let's just, try to, let's just try to run less of it. So depending on the scenario, are there features that you're paying for that you don't need? Could we remove them? Um, things that come up here are like file watchers for JSON config. File watchers are expensive. Um, reading JSON config is relatively expensive compared to the other things that are going on in startup. Setting up logging the first time, the way it's done is relatively expensive compared to the other things at startup. Uh, comparing the code sample we just saw with the kind of applications people build today, MVC is very expensive compared to that code sample. So we're taking a hard look at what features feel like they need to be part of this path. Some of those features need to go on a diet, and some of those features need to be removed completely. Um, but we think that the path forward here, if we want to make startup time better for ASP.NET Core applications, is really about trying to get more features off the critical path. Uh, next, to improve size, we turned on the linker. So hopefully some people have played with the linker, and I know, and I know you have, because I know I've talked to some of you, and I know some of you in the audience were at my Blazor workshop with uh, Steve the last couple of days. So Blazor uses the linker, uh, Mono uses the linker for Xamarin, and we ship support for the linker in .NET Core 3.0. So if you want to turn on a very, a very conservative form of trimming as part of your publish in 3.0, you have that option. Um, the, the form of trimming that we ship in the box with the linker is basically, it will look at the assemblies that are coming out of your publish output and say, if this assembly is not used at all, let's just skip it, which seems like a very safe and conservative thing to do. There are more aggressive and more radical things that you can do. So it says here, can remove unused .NET code and assemblies. Um, let's talk about why unused is in quotes. Uh, so if you've ever heard the term tree shaking before, I wanna try and provide a, a definition for it. Uh, what does tree shaking really mean? Um, the, rude, the rude quick definition I would give you, tree shaking means that you start at main and you do static analysis to try to find every piece of .NET code, every method, every type, and every member that's used. Uh, every type that's constructed, every member that's used. Uh, you start at main and you go out where you go out from there using static analysis until you run out of things to look at. Um, by the end, you have a list of things that you know are used. Everything else that you haven't seen is gone. It just gets wiped. That's the like most aggressive form of trimming that we can do, and that's generally what people mean when they sort of talk about tree shaking. So in this example, the question to ask is not what's gonna be removed. The question to ask is actually what's gonna be kept, right? Because that's how the algorithm works. So main A, B, and D need to be kept because we've seen use to them. Everything else, which is C and D, can be removed. So there are some challenges with this naturally. Um, running the linker on a large, busy .NET code, code base um, is really hard and has a lot of sort of innate difficulties that we need to work through. Uh, it turns out .NET libraries and frameworks are very complex um, and not, not, in the, not in the way that necessarily everybody's really smart, but like in a bad way when you think about the linker. Um, myself included, uh, we do a lot of things that outsmart the linker and outsmart static analysis. And if we want this to work, if we want to have this capability for .NET, we need to solve those kinds of things. Um, so what happens if you only call a method through reflection? Well, the linker tries to make some assumptions about things. It tries to figure out what you're doing. But like, really, the right answer is if you're only calling a method through reflection, um, too bad it's gone. You're going to get a crash. Uh, what about something like dependency injection, which is in every ASP.NET Core application and is used in a very key way by the framework? Well. I'll tell you something, all the constructors are only called through reflection and dynamic code generation. So they're all gone. What happens is like this widget factory service in this example has no constructor. So when the DI system tries to create it, it will just blow up and say, I can't create, I literally cannot create one of these. Um, so all the constructors are gone. What about your controllers? 
Do you reference your controllers from other parts of your code? Does MVC know about your controllers when you build? No, they're gone, right? So all of these very dynamic features that are productive, that we love, um, they, they sort of interfere with this, right? We need some smarts that can figure this kind of thing out. Um, the other problem that you run into here, and there are lots more of these, many of these problems that I just talked about are, occur in spades in uh, ASP.NET and in libraries that people use in the community, um, like your DI or your validation or your auto mapper, those kind of things, REST Sharp, great library. Um, problem that's a little bit more common in the BCL and CoreFX is something that they call a choke point API. A choke point API is when you have divergent code paths or implementations that are behind a, a runtime check. So in this example, I'm reading an XML config or a JSON config. How do I know which one? Well, I have to decide at runtime. What does the linker see? The linker sees both. So your JSON, your JSON serializer is probably a meg. Your XML serializer, if it's the .NET one, is like five. So like you really, really only want one of these if you care about the size. Maybe you don't want either. Um, so let's look at some, oh, uh, I jumped a little too fast. Let's talk about what the solutions to those things might be. The solutions to those things might be, it might be that we add smarts to the linker. It might be that we say, okay, we're gonna teach the linker about controllers. We're gonna teach the linker about DI. We're gonna teach the linker to recognize all these things. That hits a problem immediately because it doesn't help you if you're writing a library. It doesn't help um, people who maintain AutoMapper or maintain REST Sharp or any of these other great libraries that people use. So we think that the solution here is probably something to do with attributes and annotations and analyzers and a whole tool chain about making it possible for people to understand when they're, running, when they're writing code that runs a risk of breaking the linker or breaking linkability. It's a lot of work. It's a complicated problem. Um, it's not as simple as saying like, well, I know that this library doesn't work with the linker, so I'll opt it out. Because many times these libraries are libraries that you combine with types from other assemblies. So you can't just like block linking on one assembly. That's usually not gonna be enough to solve the problem. You either need to do it at the application level or you need to build an understanding with the linker and tools to try and make it possible to do this safely. So let's look at some perf results. These are the size results and hopefully this will help show you the, a little bit of the impact and why, why we're excited about this. So normal self-contained published 92 megabytes. That's what you get today. Uh, if you use the linker in conservative mode, which is something you can do today, 74 megabytes. That's something that's within reach for you. You can get there. Um, if you turn the linker up to aggressive mode, which is what I was just talking about, and you add the single file host, you can get down to 42 megabytes based on the current tech, assuming we make no changes to .NET. So the work that I did to, do, to get here is basically road extensibility for the linker that understands ASP.NET DI and understands MVC's controllers and things like that, and that can get us down to 42 megabytes. We can get down to about the 25 to 28 range by making a bunch of assumptions about work that we will do in the future. So doing more prototyping, coming up with hard-coded lists of things to delete, yes, literally delete from the output, and uh, thinking hard about what those things are. We think that the best case for this based on the current tech is down around 25 to 28 megs, uh, depending on what features you want to be part of that. Now the good news here is that which features you're using inside your app or which uh, code you write inside your application and the volume of code you write inside your application has a very, very small impact on these numbers. The thing, that, the thing that really changes this dial is not like how much code do you write. The volume of your code is probably not gonna make a big difference. Uh, the thing that does make a big difference is what are your library dependencies and what are your library dependencies within .NET? If you have one method that calls regex, you need all the regex stuff. If you have one method that calls XML, you need all the XML stuff. So making a choice like using XML for config versus an INI file or something like that can have a really big impact on the size if you get down to this 28 to 25 uh, megabyte level. Uh, and just to prove I'm not bluffing, this is a screenshot. This is a 25 megabyte uh, Linux executable single file that works and runs and is a REST API using JSON serialization and uh, some of the stuff that we talked about earlier. So basically an app that's really similar to the one we looked at in the last demo. Uh, just to be very clear about this, this is the best case. So this is with us making a lot of assumptions and hoping for the best and saying, well, we think we, we, think we might be able to achieve this if we tried really hard. Um, I'm gonna speed up a little bit because I'm almost out of time. So um, these are some perf results for startup. 
um, top line there, what you get today. Uh, caveat, we always include a single, we always include a request as part of measuring startup for ASP.NET, because otherwise it would be very easy for us to cheat by just being lazier and not doing initialization while main is running. So we always measure main and first request and then combine them, that's what you're seeing here. So the black line, the second one, is the impact of the single file host. It's a pure just downward shift, 30, 40 milliseconds of benefit, no real trade-off for you. Um, the other line, the, the sort of uh, melon-colored or coral-colored line at 200, is uh, removing MVC and removing a bunch of managed features that we're saying, well, maybe you don't need it in this scenario. So there's about 100 milliseconds of, of time to get back by slimming down the amount of code that needs to run, the amount of assemblies that need to get loaded, and so on. Um, so the best thing that you could do to help, this is probably the most experimental thing we're talking about today. I'd love to hear from people, what scenarios do you have where you're using self-contained publish? What would smaller, faster .NET mean? What would you use it for? Uh, what, what are your deployment environments? What are your constraints? Those kind of things. Uh, let's shift gears and we're gonna talk about Blazor and Electron. So hopefully you're a little bit familiar with Blazor, but uh, if you're not, you're gonna get a taste in just a second. Uh, if you like what you see and you wanna learn about Blazor and go to a good general Blazor talk, uh, my friend Steve Sanderson's gonna be on today a little bit later in this room. I encourage you to go to his talk and check it out. Uh, we've shipped Blazor Server as part of .NET Core 3.0, so that's new. And we've officially announced Blazor WebAssembly support shipping May in 2020. Uh, beyond that, what's on the horizon for Blazor? Well, we have lots of ideas about improving tools. We have lots of ideas about supporting more of, of what browsers give you. And we have lots of ideas about more language features and goodies for Blazor. However, we're also very keen on adding more app models, more hosting models, and more ways to run Blazor. I'm gonna show you a little bit of a marriage, what a marriage might look like between Blazor and Electron, and what are some of the things that that might give you. Um, and we've, we've shown some samples of Electron in use before, but we haven't really done a deep dive, and we haven't really talked that much about what the advantages of that are. So let's jump right into that. And just to be a little bit different, because it's Blazor and it's special, we're gonna do the demo first this time. So let me get my Blazor solution here. Now I like to call this B Electron, and everyone else seems to, seems to pronounce it Blectron, and it kind of irks me. But I guess make up, make up your own mind uh, what you think is right. Um, your interpretation is as valid as mine. So I'll go ahead and get this fired up. This is building. Okay, so I've got my app, and this is just a Blazor template app that I have Blectronized. I have put this inside of an Electron shell. Uh, if you're not familiar with Electron, Electron is the desktop application that powers things like VS Code and a bunch of other stuff. Um, it is Chromium and Node in a desktop application shell. It is cross-platform. It works on every operating system you'd care about for desktops. And it has a rich ecosystem with a bunch of features like crash reporting, auto updates, installers, publishing, and so on. And I have taken my Blazor app and I have put it inside this Electron shell and you can see it's giving me this sort of single page application kind of feel and activity. And I've got in the background here the code for what's on the screen right now. I've got a .NET event handler hooked up to an HTML button. And when I click that button, you can see my .NET event handler code is running, is incrementing that count, and Blazor is updating that markup. Um, Electron, all of the UI that you're seeing here is HTML because it's Chromium. So it's the HTML web stack of technologies in the browser powering the UI. So I had a conversation with my boss this morning and he said that he's very concerned about our overuse of this counter button. Um, all of these counter increments are very precious resources. We pay, we pay by the click and um, his boss, his boss is a real tight wad I'm here. And so he wants to know, is there any way we could reduce our usage of the counter? So I thought I would gently nag people to avoid um, using so much counter. And the way that I wanna do that is I wanna show an operating system notification if you have exceeded your quota for the count. So I'm gonna get the notification service from DI. Uh, this is something that I've added from the prototype, so don't assume that this exists today. Uh, I'll get the notification service. And I wanna say, if your current count is greater than or equal to 10, then I wanna show you a notification. And I can use this notification service, and you can see I have this this show async method here, and I can give it a notification options or I can give it a title and body. Uh, in the interest of time, I have one that I have written already here. 
you don't have to watch me struggle to type. So I'm going to show you a rude notification and kind of tell you off if you exceed your count. I don't know why that's not building. Oh, because I need to make this async. Let's do that real quick. Get this going and watch the bottom right corner of the screen. So I'm going to click, get to nine. The next one didn't happen. OK, great. Well, that's, that's, ah, because focus assist is on. That's great. Uh, let's turn off focus assist now. There it is. So I get my notification. Yeah, 13 is really too many. I should probably stop. Uh, let's do something else. So, so notifications, interaction with the operating system, easy to do when you're inside of a desktop application. What else can we do? So I have this fetch data page that's loading this weather report and sort of uh, pulling it from the internet and showing it to you in this nice little UI. Now, I heard from my boss that he doesn't really like using this application. He doesn't really like this UI. You know, I think I've done a good job on it, but uh, he really prefers Excel, and it's, his needs are very important. Um, so it'd be great if we could get this data somehow into Excel. Uh, if you've been to Blazor Talks before, you've probably seen us uh, do some Excel interop here. Um, so I can do that. I'm going to copy one of our previous demos, and I'm going to give it its own little twist. So we're going to export this data from Excel, or from, from the Electron window into Excel. And I'm just going to define this little export function. And I'm going to totally put it in the wrong place and stuff up my demo. Just a sec. So I'm going to define this ep export function. I am using a library here called EP+. Um, I don't feel like this code is too hard to understand, but basically creating an Excel package, adding a worksheet, and then it's got this nice little function where you give it some .NET type, and it will just automatically create columns and rows from that collection. Pretty cool, pretty convenient. Um, so if I wanted to, because it's a Blazor application, I could add an HTML button here, and I could say at on click, and I could have a, an export button, but that's not very snazzy. That doesn't really show off the power of B Electron uh, if I have to add a button to do that. What if I could add a native context menu to do that? So that is what I'm going to do. So I can get from the cascading parameter system a parameter that I have defined. If you have not seen cascading parameters before, do not let it throw you. Um, this is just basically a way of saying this is a value that is passed down through my UI tree, kind of like a context in React if you're at all familiar with that. If you're not, I apologize, but just pretend that I get an access to the menu somehow and I can do something. And the reason why it's a cascading parameter and not a DI service is, well, I've hooked it up to the routing system. So I can add context menus per page and then they sort of show when they're on that page, and then they go away when you're not on that page. So I can scope this functionality to a given page. Let's go ahead and define a menu. So for my menu, I have this set context menu method, and I will pass a new menu item. And I'm going to set the label of this to be export to Excel. And I'm going to set my click action on this menu to call my export function. Now, the thing that's missing here is that we haven't really done anything with this. We're just creating the worksheet. We're not putting it anywhere. But because I'm inside Electron and I'm inside of a desktop application, well, I could just save it to the temp directory, and I can just open Excel. I can do all those things. I don't have to prompt you for a file download, which is how this, this uh, demo would normally go. I can just do it directly because I'm on the desktop machine. So let me grab that snippet real quick, and let's give this a try. That is a context menu also. Loading, loading. So you see if I come to my counter page, I can hit that context menu and it's empty. But if I come to my fetch data page, I can hit that context menu and I have this nice native looking context menu here that says export to Excel. Let's, let's hope that it works. Boom. So there it is in Excel. Inside the Blazor process, I'm able to create this worksheet. I'm able to save it to disk and I'm able to open it. And the reason why that works is that I'm inside of a normal .NET Core process. So all the things that you could do in a normal .NET Core process with B-Electron, you can just do. Um, skip over that. So how this works, um, we run your Blazor app in a .NET Core process, which is similar to how Blazor Server works. We use the Electron.NET library to control Electron. So we're using a, a third-party library that someone else has created that's on the internet. Uh, there's a link there if you want to check it out. We're using that to boot Electron and manage a lot of the communication with it. 
Inside the electron renderer process, we have a custom build of Blazor's JavaScript support code. And we have a custom renderer inside of our .NET process that's managing the communication between those two. So you have a .NET process that's remote controlling basically a Chrome process to give you an HTML UI. Um, the fact that it's a .NET process means that, well, you've got that familiar .NET programming environment as well as our, all of our existing tools and uh, diagnostic capabilities that you have for .NET. So what might this look like in the future if we chose to invest in this? Well, we would need to build a bunch of blazery ways to do Electron. I, I maybe showed you a couple in the, in the demo here. I had, a I had a notification service. I had a, um, I had a menu manager kind of thing. Uh, it would probably come with us building a bunch of blazer capabilities for Electron features that we don't have. Um, we'd need to take a look at the Electron API surface, which is extensive, and figure out what of those things you need to be successful in Blazor, uh, as well as a bunch more docs and recipes. Um, in addition, the fact that we'd be doing something like Electron means that we would need a new tool chain. We'd need .NET build, uh, .NET build support to build the Electron application, .NET publish support to publish it, um, as well as templates and probably integrations for you with their crash reporting and their updating service. So with that, I'm at time, and I'm out of stuff to say, so thanks for coming. Um, you can find these materials online a little bit later today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.